motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. Let's dive into today's episode. My guest today on One for the Road is a thought leader, an entrepreneur, author, speaker, and mother of 10. She also hosts two podcasts called School for Mothers and School for Fathers, which I've also been a guest on. She is an amazing woman, so please welcome Danusha Melina Durban. So welcome, Danusha, to my podcast, One for the Road. I feel like I'm in the presence of royalty today because you are absolutely amazing. And we've been friends for a while now. And we could literally spend the whole podcast talking about your achievements. But we're here to talk about your relationship with alcohol, where it began and where you are now of it. And uh, as you know, I love to start from the beginning. And I'm quite interested in uh, finding out where you grew up and how it was for you uh, at a younger age. So how are you today? Oh, well, that's a a wonderful intro, Dave. Thank you. And and, um, yeah, um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good for being on the podcast. I've really been looking forward to this because, yeah, I I just really have. I I love what you do. So, you know, it's good. And and you've got an amazing podcast. We can talk about that later on. Yeah, you know, Uh, if if it comes up. (laughs) You know, can't stand these guests that come on and keep lagging on about their, their, their stuff, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Where did I grow up? Oh, uh, well, I grew up in on the edge of Dartmoor uh, and it took three buses to get to school. So, you know, connecting buses and you can imagine if you missed one, stranded, basically, completely stranded. There was a, a section of this journey that I really mean there was nothing to do an exposed, you know, kind of setting, um, wilds, basically, Um, just gorse and some sheep and some Dartmoor ponies. And that was it. So the timing of this was really important. And so it was a, I think there was uh, maybe about four girls. I might be wrong. There might be a, you know, there'll probably be one that's listening just by luck. Um, There might have been maximum six girls that lived out on the wilds. And so we were the, we were the Dartmoor girls. Um, and and that was it was a convent, Dave. As if you probably didn't know, I went to a convent with straw boaters <laughs> and real nuns. There were ah. there were real nuns in the convent. So, and it wasn't that long ago, but I mean, I think there's a few nuns still in the school. So it's it, it was it was good, but it was you know very rural, obviously. Um, and I actually I actually dedicated the majority of my childhood. All, all, all of it to dancing at a professional level so I won a scholarship to the Royal Ballet um, a regional scholarship and and that meant that I danced six days a week and had to be very very self-determined to m- make sure that I accomplished what I needed to um, so I was very clear about what I wanted so I had to rely on my parents to support that and to be honest they they left me to it they were like, oh, Denisha knows what she wants. We just need to kind of do what we need to do. Mm. But the important thing about the the three journey, the school buses, and they weren't school buses, they were public buses, obviously. But um, the three buses were that I had to rely on my dad to come and get me if it all went tits up, basically. Um, that obviously happened when I was, I think, 13 and decided that I'd try and smoke. <laughs> you know and I looked incredibly young so I looked about eight nine I always did and and uh that meant that trying to find someone that looked old enough to try and buy cigarettes I'm not condoning this by the way but of course that would mean that I would then in my miss the bus and so dad had a penchant for for vodka so <laughs> dad uh, an entrepreneur ran his own petrol stations 
um, adopted me in his 50s with my mum in her 50s. Um, so very much my grandparents' generation, if you like. He was a staunch Polish Catholic, very much involved with the Polish community, heavy drinking, lots of damage from the war. He'd escaped concentration camp um, as one of the very youngest kids that had actually been in there, but he'd also escaped and travelled through Poland, through Scandinavia and got to England. I mean, during that journey, a couple of the boys that escaped with him died um it was traumatic dave and one of the fallouts from his unresolved trauma which he you know never talked about he did with me because i was very close to him a little bit he would talk but not much he never really processed it but he would hide food so he hid food from his family i'd go in the airing cupboard to find some stinky cheese in there and i'd go what's this you know oh you know that's that's my food not ours my food his food and also the other funny thing was that we had a dead it's not funny a poor dad we had a we had a car that was a dedicated escape car this sounds really weird doesn't it I mean in the yeah in the drive was because he was you know a motor engineer so he had all these car workshops and petrol stations he obviously, and at home, we had a great big, you know, whatever they're called, the ramps and the things like that, because we were very lucky. We had a beautiful home and big grounds. And, and he, but he kept this dedicated car with a special engine in it to escape the Russians. This is funny. My mum used to really take the piss out of him because we own, it very rarely drove it. This was the car that we would escape in. And she'd say, we're on an island, Victor. His, his name's actually Spishik, but nobody could say Spishik, so <laughs> he called himself Victor. And she'd say, Victor, don't be ridiculous. You know, like, where are you going to go with this car? So he'd hide his booze in there. He'd hide in little brown bags. He'd. I, I knew the extent of his drinking. My mum would look the other way and he would... You know, he, he would smoke his little roll-ups, taught me just, you know, do his rollies. And he'd have his little vodka bottle. And he'd, you know, like most lots of kids, I'd rifle through his things, <laughs> you know, in his office. And I'd like look in his filing drawer and there would be, you know, some bottles in there. So that, you know, the backdrop to my childhood was my dad's, my dad's unspoken about success but and feast and famine entrepreneurship you know one minute we were millionaires the next we had nothing mm. <laughs> mum had to take the curtains down and make me something for a school play mm. but but no one knew that you know no one knew because the veneer of wealth was there and um, but of course I was an adopted child so I knew they were to be blunt they were all strangers too it was like hmm so the universe I literally used to look at them going hmm well, I was chosen by these people. Hmm. <laughs> How interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, that's the backdrop of the war for my dad was crippling, crippling to his mental health. And now we would have a completely different take on it. Completely different. He would be, you know, he would be supported and for traumatic, you know, experiences that lived with him to the day he died. And I was very close to my dad. So, you know, and he did stop drinking. He did. He, he, he really did. I mean, I, I had to go rescue his, his false teeth from a major accident that he, that he had because he'd been drinking heavily. No, it was me that had, to, as his power of attorney, had to take his, his uh, eventually had to take his license. It was, it was sad. Mm. He, he, he couldn't find the boundary. And then he did. And in very old age, he did, you know. It, it, it was that's it was quite sad. a story isn't it oh dave that was a bit more than you were imagining wasn't well, no, it? it's it's fascinating actually I, I love things like this and I, um but so when he used to hide the bottles and that how old were you when you really started to dabble in alcohol yourself then well i i find this one interesting because i didn't until i was in my late 20s wow yeah yeah i mean i i was it just wasn't on my landscape. I'd have a glass of wine at Christmas. 
Yeah. No, that was it. I was one of those people that it just wasn't in my realm, even though my dad had been, you know, really an alcoholic, you know, I mean, but I'd seen the damage. I'd seen yeah. the damage that it had done to their relationship, to us as children, as I I had witnessed that I, I was that child and I, and there was other things, you know, I, my, my adopted brother from a different family. So not biologically related at all, but he, he turned out to be paranoid schizophrenic um, and inherited a part of very acute um, mental um, health problems um, and has been in secure units most of his life. So, I mean, my childhood was anything but <laughs> kind of, you know, two kids and mummy and daddy and happy, happy. It was, but it, we, we had a great deal of wealth. So I, I had to grow up very early. I was a, um, a stand-in parent. You know, I was a stand-in beside my mother to, because my dad numbed out. Um, so I knew the mode by which he numbed out and that was alcohol. He couldn't cope. He just couldn't, um, but he could make money and he could do his job and he was charming and a wonderful human but he couldn't cope with yeah. his demons. Yeah? yeah. So I didn't until, yeah, I mean, maybe I was 27, something like that. It, it wasn't a big epiphany of like, I'm going to get some alcohol in me. It yeah. was just it, gradually, you know, I'd have a bottle of Grolsch or a, yeah, it was, it was post university because I went when I was already a mother and yeah, it was, it was something to do with that era that suddenly booze kind of came on the scene it, it you know and it wasn't a it wasn't a love of oh I like this no it was just a a gradual increase of this is just what we do socially <laughs> this is you know was it socially because of your work um it did become that yes once I was in the city yeah um, you know consulting and that whole that whole part of um yeah, oiling relationships. Yeah, fit in. Yeah, in and, uh, <laughs> yeah just that. Our meetings and. Yeah, yeah. And let's, let's, you know, oh, we've had a nice meeting. Let's all decamp to the pub. Yeah. You know, or let's go to a fancy restaurant, but get sloshed. Or let's go to a private members club and, and you know, not come out for five hours. And, and I mean, I've always had to return because I've always had children. Um, You know, I mean, literally, you know, since I was a teenager. So I. I and and I think you know part of my having children so young is part of creating my own family that had some stability that didn't feel as scary you know my my childhood was scary mm. if I was going to make anything of myself I was going to have to get out of that place <laughs> you know with these quite quite unusual characters that I'd found myself in um, I wasn't a chosen adopted child, by the way. I should say that, you know, no one, they couldn't find anyone to have me from the orphanage. <laughs> that sounds really weird, but they were like, my parents were due a little boy and that fell through. And they said, well, we've got this girl. And mum was like, oh, we wanted a boy. <laughs> hey, Arlene, I want to give you a big hug. <laughs> no, I, oh, thanks. No, it, it really isn't. I've done a huge amount of therapy around this. Yeah. You know, I say this with a lot of love for my parents. Yeah. I really do. Um, so, but as a child, I actually also have a lot of love for that little girl, kind of watching them of, oh, because I was told I was supposed to be a boy. <laughs> you know, it wasn't you we were waiting for. So it, that whole idyllic, oh, we chose you, we loved you, we, we made your room. Mm, it's not always the case yeah. in adoptive stories, you know. It can be a harsher reality. And, of course, for some, it's wonderful. Um, so my, my drinking, I think, just, well, naturally, because we know that it does, our threshold changes. And also societally, we became, we've become such a at home. I mean, I'm, you know, as a mother, I couldn't get sloshed in pubs. I had to equip myself with what I needed because I had to be at home, you know. So to crack open a Prosecco, a bottle of Prosecco, has just become very condoned, as we know, in that kind of mummy, mummy deserves her wine, just like she needs beautiful hair, you know, products and love, needs lovely handbags in certain, you know, classes, if you like. That's what we're sold. And so, well, why not? Why, why not? 
why shouldn't I? And for me, I worked out a few things about my drinking, which was I, I realized that it was probably the only thing that I had that nobody else could touch. I didn't have anything for myself at all. Not really, because my work isn't, yes, it's for me, but I mean, it's work. It's, you know, it's wonderful. And I love consulting and doing you know, the boardroom things that I do, but it's not actually for Danusha. It's not a feeder to me. It's not, not exclusively nourishing just Danusha. It's actually about my clients and the results and blah, blah. And so I, rem- I realized that when I was fiercely territorial of my bottle of Prosecco, which then sometimes would go into a second one. And I realized once I'd drunk two bottles that I really that was, that was it. I had boundaries around it, but I, 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 this fierce territorialism about my bottles of Prosecco. If people came, I'd be like, that's, that's actually mine. That one in, that one in the fridge, that's mine. I was very overt about it. It's like, don't touch that one. <laughs> that's, and it was a need. It was like, I need that. That's mine. And, and it's, it could be like, not unlike my dad. Not unlike my dad with the cheese in the cupboard, which was, that's my cheese. If things go bad and the Russians come, I know I can eat. Yeah. So it was an interesting unpacking for me in terms of that, that kind of the sadness of that, really, that actually I'd got myself created a world that actually didn't give me much more than a bloody bottle of Prosecco. Great success. Money, you know, acclaim and all that stuff that you were mentioning, which you know, look it up, it's there, but it's, but it's, but actually when really I, it it was a bit of a friend, you know, it was my friend. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, let's say you have 10 kids, right? Yeah, I have 10 children. Ten, yeah. Ten Six children. sons, four, four daughters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're incredibly successful in business. Uh, so mm. basically you give such a lot. So it's how we frame what we give back to ourselves. And quite often we turn to that because it doesn't answer back, although it's got this control over us and whatever. And we we know it's going to be the perfect company for the evening when most of the time it isn't. No, exactly. But we we fool ourselves, don't we? And we it's Mm -hmm. something we can rely on to do what we want it to do, which is to blunt out the volume of what's going on in the day, what's going on tomorrow and whatever. So the, the demands, the demands, the the constant, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a decision, I'm paid to make decisions for people, basically at very high levels about lots of money and very important things that other people think are hugely important. And they are, but actually um, that means that that fatigue needs needs the definite reliable I need this. I need the job done. Not unlike actually why lots of women use vibrators because it's a job done. <laughs> you know, like let's not faff around here. That's not my bag to be honest, but which is interesting, <laughs> you know, more information than you need, but <laughs> hey ho. <laughs> but, I go, I suppose, but, I <laughs> but the fact is booze can do that. Now, one of the interesting things I found interesting is that I never drink vodka. I have never. Is that I don't your dad. Yes, my, I don't drink vodka at all. Yeah. Um, not not at all. And I come unstuck with cocktails. I mean, I have to say, I've been sober for three years and rock solid. You know, I mean, I'm I, I'm I love being sober. It's it's I have grown more in this three years and had deeper, bigger, more meaningful success in every area of my life since I've become sober than all the rest put together. And I'm so proud, Dave, that I feel really tearful about it. I I have I have triplets of mine. And they just say, well, mummy, you don't drink, do you, mummy? I've never seen you have a drink, mummy. And do you know the music that that is to my ears? Mm. Because my other children have experienced, you know, me changing quite naturally because that's what alcohol does to us we know you know whether that's being morose whether that's going inside oneself you know just becoming disconnected from others Mm. um whether that's tapping into anger um you know or just not quite tapping in (laughs) tapping into something that isn't productive or or 
functional to the relationship. I, they've had that. And that's taken some talking through. That's taken some, not my earlier, not my, because I'd already had children by the time I started drinking. It's actually probably my two teen girls that really saw me drink more. And, and we talk about it. You know, we, we, this is very something we openly discuss about the differences that my triplets experience with a mum who is fully present, not necessarily always fully happy, yeah. but fully present yeah. to everything yeah. and in command of myself at least a choice, if I'm going to shout at them, which I try not to do too often, but I do, then I, I've done that because I'm not fueled by some, you know, a bottle of white wine. For me, it was like poison. It, it was just, it, I, I like to say, because actually I don't think there's anyone in my family, that, and I'm talking about my children, that does well with alcohol. Mm. I don't think there's anyone. I have a, I have a son who is sober chose to become sober um i'm not sure how many years now it might be five six seven i mean it's a long time because one pint and he'd if you looked at him wrong he'd punch you wow it it, it really destabilizes him and it took him a while i know it took him a while to get over the fact that because we talked about it like actually why can other people do it but i can't you know and i think that is something to unhook from why do other people seem to have a good time and be all right with it? Yeah. Or seem to be okay. Yeah, with it? well, I was going to mention that because <laughs> quite often behind the store is a different thing, you know. Like, I, I often think about people that are in these little market town squares and they all seem to be mm. sipping on their pints and or the mummy wine culture where, you know, when I was in the carpet game, half, three, four o'clock, come there, pick the kids up and all go around the house and open the Prosecco up at four. Yep. And I was thinking, right, well, how many of these mums go home and open another bottle? You know, it's not all what it seems. I've had a glass of uh, Prosecco after the school run. It's like, what about half eight when the kids are in the bathroom and going to bed and reading stories? How, how is it then? You know, not everything's as it seems. And I talk to a lot of grey area drinkers uh, and it's that, I hook into is like, have you got children? How old are they? But, you know, I go in for the kill a bit because it's important for people to really see it for what it is. You know, it's not that chinking of the glass and, oh, this is great, mummy, one o'clock or whatever it is. It's a lot deeper than that. Uh, Well, it is. It's could you get your children out of a fire? Could you? Could you? Take them to the hospital if one of them fell over. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you know, Obviously, we know that when we start, we start organising our life around the availability of, you know, oh, I've got to pick them up. That means then I could have a couple of glasses, which means then, you know, all this kind of logistical Mm. dance that we do with ourselves in order to to nourish. And I say that advisedly, give ourselves what we think we need when actually it's it. It just undermines everything. And I noticed that I I was fine in the kind of waking day and the in the evening, the waking evening. I actually became somebody who drank and was benign. You know, it's not like I was whipping my clothes off or, you know, doing anything inappropriate or aggressive or um worrying, anything like that. I actually just became quiet yeah which was very interesting because I had you know I had gone through phases and I for me it coincided with hormones and um you know mine have been up and down up and down um because of you know having lots of children so they were which they are anyway for all of us humans but I'd had big highs big lows through many births and but I noticed that I, I moved into this kind of benign, oh, she's had half a bottle or a bottle or a bottle and a half. Or It doesn't really matter the amount. Mine wasn't so big. It's the impact. Yeah. It, was, it was vicious. But I, I got to the point where, sounds really funny, but I was just bored. I was bored of myself. And I was bored of, I was actually bored of um, waking in the middle of the night, hating myself. 
all day I was about, you know, this, and I'm not, I'm not somebody that has to work at being positive. I genuinely can see, you know, solutions and opportunities in whatever shit is thrown at me and companies and all of that stuff. But at three in the morning, I would literally berate myself. That's when I would do the hating thing. And I would feed myself with such vitriol that I had to work on getting up back up to a like, oh, okay, I can cope with, okay, it's all right, Danusha. I had to actually got to the point where I was like 45 minutes in bed, awake, just mantraing like, you can do it. You're okay. You, you've, I mean, literally, and it was actually, I hadn't made the link between, well, if you stop pouring that in your, your gut, mm. <laughs> you might actually, let's see, do you do that to yourself? I did read this quote about, um, I can't remember who it's by, but it was a very successful president of somewhere like Coca-Cola. Don't quote me on that though, but it, it's a woman in America who's incredibly accomplished. And she said, well, I had to choose. I either did travel away with the business and, and kept doing what I need to do in the world, or I just drank. And for her, she said, so I gave up drink because I couldn't do everything in the amount of the day that I was compass mentors. I think that that kind of just planted a tiny little seed. And one day I didn't tell anybody. I just thought, I think I might, I think I just might give this fucking thing up. Yeah. Just give it up. Yeah. <laughs> what would happen if you give it up? Yeah. I saw it as an experiment because I knew it was, it had its clutches on me. I knew that it was like Ivy. So yeah. Like right around me. I was like, you know, I'd send my children up to the Sainsbury's, like, just get me another Prosecco, would you? You know, swinging the bag. And, and because I didn't want to go, but I'd send the child. He was obviously old enough. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not talking about young children. But, you know, that, that relationship, I didn't want that. What was I doing? What was I actually teaching my children? That mummy needs you to go, to go and get her booze from the local, you know, terribly nice she she plays but mummy needs her booze because she's run out I mean I just didn't want that in my life um but I couldn't make a big song and dance about it Dave because I might have screwed it <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you why I know that is because when I met you you dropped it in and you said to me oh by the way I haven't had a drink for three months or four months or whatever it was then yeah. and, and it's like Wow, I didn't know that. You know what I mean? It was just <laughs> like saying, oh, do you know what? I haven't had a cup of coffee for two days. And and I know how hard it is for the first three months to do that. But you, it's funny, you know, like how you just embrace that yourself. Because in a way, that's kind of how I did it myself. But I did have a prompt, but I looked ahead. So there's this whole one day at a time thing that we use, which yes. is, we need to do that. But the other thing was visualizing ahead of how my life would look if I yeah. removed this one thing from my life because I seemed to be in control of everything else but this because it was in control of me. Yes, exactly. And I hated that. I absolutely hated it because I, one, be, hate being told what to do, but this drug was telling me how I could live. Well, I was in life. charge of you, Dave, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. the three o'clock in the morning, which mm. everyone I relate to, you wake up and your eyeballs are like saucepans, but... You know, that's you withdrawn from alcohol basically, and the, full of anxiety and thinking, oh, I've got a big meeting in the city in the morning, I'm going to feel and look terrible and whatever. But then you start negotiating it throughout the day, don't you? Of, of mm -hmm. like, okay, maybe one later on, and well, I'm having, I'm doing all right today, it's okay. And so mm -hmm. the whole conversation goes round and round and round again. Mm -hmm. So it's always quite. It's I love the expression you say, Ivy. I come up with poison ivy in my head straight, mm -hmm. you know, like wrapped around your throat. It is and gradually getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and that's why people say to me, "My life, I don't know how to take control," mm -hmm. and it, it really makes like it goosebumps for me with people that tell me these stories and I just want to reach out and say look it is possible it it is so possible to change this but at the time it feels so out of reach doesn't it it does and I, I for me I, I have a feeling that when we because I'm a 
you know, I'm I'm as near as an industrial psychologist as you can get. We just don't have them in the UK. That's why I say it like that. But, you know, from a psychologist's perspective, we have to look at our patterns of how we deal with things and 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 be realistic about the kind of strategies that we are successful with in other areas of our lives. Yeah. So my husband hated smokers. He's he's an ex-husband, by the way. So <laughs> he's not dead. When I say hated, it's because we're no longer married. Um, <laughs> and he so, of course, in my ridiculous idea of my head, I thought, oh, OK, you hate. Them. I'll start smoking. Let's see how much you hate them. Huh. Yeah, I mean, come on, that's damaged childhood. OK, it's like, let's see where this love goes. Yeah, you can, <laughs> can you do it? <laughs> So I started smoking 20 and I, I'm not a smoker at all. I, when I was a child, I hated them. Okay. So I tried them. I hated them. But just for this, I was like, huh, okay, good. Let's do this then, shall we? So I smoked 20 a day for six months and I hated it. I hated them. I don't, you know, I, for others, you do you, but I, I absolutely hated it. He hated it. He said he hated the smell and he didn't like going near me. So, of course, I, you know, but he did. Oh, he did. It was fine. But I, so I tested that. Now, the reason I tell you that is because he was like, well, you're a hardened smoker now. That's it. You're done, aren't you? I didn't want to marry a hardened smoker. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 you underestimate me. And I stopped like that. Yeah. And I was like, ha. And he was like, you'll never do it. I was like, I will. I know myself. I make a pact. I do it. And, and yes, it's all very all or nothing. And I'm aware of this. Yeah. And I was all booze <laughs> and then nothing. And I'm happy with my nothing. And I was facts and then no facts, <laughs> you know, because actually, and I walked down the booze aisles. I walked down. I she bought a bottle the other day. Not for me. But I was like my girlfriend, my really close friend. She she does drink. We don't drink together. She said, she happened to say to me, I haven't had a bottle of champagne in years. And I thought, do you know what? And I really thought, wow, how's this going to feel? Because my thing was, I went on champagne courses. I even wrapped it up like I was a, you know, I was an expert on champagne. No, I was just I like boozing with bubbles. <laughs> you know. And I could talk to you about lots of champagne stuff, but I won't. Um, and, and, you know, so I thought, why not? What, what would it feel like? But Dave, what I had to do was when it went through, and I literally had that and some chocolates for her, because she loves chocolates. I was like, I had to say to the guy, I had to say to him, this is not for me. <laughs> I just had to say, I'm actually sober, but it feels quite funny doing this because I had to like process it externally rather than like, actually this, no, this was too reminiscent. It was like, no. And he said, it was beautiful. And he said, well, that's interesting. I gave up booze a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he said oh hasn't my life changed and we had this wonderful sober conversation at, in front of my triplets you know that they were hearing somebody else talking about the, the the effects for him on his life this was in Morrison's or somewhere and I was like yes so I could do it I could do it I could oh I can buy things and I for me I know that my pattern is when I want to do something hard enough strong enough when I have a compelling reason which for me it was my life what's who's the woman that I want to be yeah yeah who do I want to be in this world it's such a short moment that we have mm. and what do I want it, it, but it had to be about me not doing it for the kids yeah. doing it for I, I couldn't do it for anyone else it had to be how low do you want to go my love how low it's we are so similar, honestly, because I had exactly the same with fags. I used to roll up fags, right? Uh, but I only would only ever smoke them. That's back in the day. You could smoke in a pub or in oh, wow. a bar or in a bloody plane, top of the bus. I mean, imagine that now, Ooh. sitting in a cinema and someone sparking up a Rothmans. Um, <laughs> Please. Uh, but anyway. No, I, I, I did menthol, Dave. I did oh, menthols, no. oh, yeah. which which my husband was like, do you really think that helps? <laughs> I don't, probably are a bit. I don't know. I'm not going to go into that. But anyway, I used to smoke um, Golden Virginia roll-ups and I used to pre-roll them and I even had my old man's tin with all the fags in and whatever. Uh, yep. And then I used to chain smoke in the pub, like literally chain it and then go home to my flat and then chain there. 
but I wouldn't smoke all day. But one day I had a bit of a throat in that, and I thought, Do you know what? I'm sick of this. And I gave up there, and that was 20 years ago on the spot. And I was kind of like that with drink as well, because I knew I had to do it, and I kept saying, I know I've got to do something about it. Mm. So on paper, it looked like I gave up like that, uh, which is spontaneous sobriety. I think Annie Grace's dad did the same. He was on a bottle of whiskey a day. But for me, well, I was on the litre of vodka a day, so I went from that to nothing overnight. Mm. But there was a lot of inner conversation going on for yes. several months of, mm. uh, mate, you, you have reached an all-time rock bottom here, you know. And what you say about the vodka, I swore to myself for years and years I would never drink spirit. That was my mm. mantra. I ended up drinking spirit because a bit what you say about getting the job done, right, well, it takes more to get a job done, well, doesn't it? I wanted the quicker way of, yes, of course. Of vodka, it would be, right, well, that can get that done in 15 minutes and I, I can go comfortably numb like the Pink Floyd song within mm-hmm. a minute of walking in my door to being the man who's making all the decisions, doing all this and, and whatever, to being comatosed within 15 minutes because I could drink half a bottle of vodka in 15 minutes and then... Yeah just dribble into the the bottle after that you know so for me to do that I I had to ask myself certain questions like where are you going to be if you're going to be here in 10 years time what is your quality of life going to be like in five years time what's your health going to be like what, mm-hmm. what's your relationships going to be like what are you going to look like all these things right mm-hmm. and those questions really helped me to come up with a decision of mate you're in your 50s now what do you want out of life? What quality of life do you want? And and that just, it was a no brainer for me. And I say that it was a no brainer. Stop, mate. You've got one chance here. It's almost like the, the escape from prison. Quick, the cell doors open. You've got this amount of time to run Seconds out of there. Yeah. You're not going back to Mr. Big, you know, and that's how it was for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hear you completely. And, and I, Absolutely. Those questions. But the that's so important. And the the process that you talk about of gradually, gradually facing that it it can happen, of course, like overnight and, and in one one moment. But I think actually we warm up and warm up and warm up. I remember listening to liver disease interviews like Radio 4 happened to happened to listen to the impacts of our wards being full of young people um, with liver disease brought on by binge drinking and how and I remember scaring myself, seeking them out, like literally like where else can I listen to this kind of stuff? Like tell me about there was mothers and, and, and fathers talking about this sheer agony that their children had gone through and died. And because it's one of the most painful deaths. And and I was like, bring it on, tell me so that I can try and, you know, like maybe that'll get me there. Mm. <laughs> I knew, I knew at a deep level that I needed to do something for me. And that was the thing. So that bottle, those bottles had been for me, but I needed to be bigger than them. Oh my God, the clank of those bottles, the clank of the, I remember the bin men used to laugh. Like, and I, and I started taking them to the tip on my own. I was like, I'll take some of them. Then they can stop not laughing. Now I take a jam jar and a, <laughs> and a maple syrup that goes on my granola. And I giggle. <laughs> I giggle when I put the clear one in. And then very occasionally, I think since February, maybe one, one or two, um, you know, like 0% beers. Because yeah. I don't have like replacement. I mean, I know there's Prosecco that I could know Secco and all that stuff. I realise that. But I, for me, that's, I know myself. No, no that's not going to work for me. So I'm very careful about those beers. I'm like, I, I literally go, is this 0.5% or 0%? <laughs> they look at me like I'm, I, I have people show me the bottle. I'm like, I cannot drink alcohol. And I don't care if they think I'm a raving alcoholic. I really don't care because I'm I don't identify as that yeah. uh, you know so it's about how I feel about myself and if I did well that would be fine too but I love that I just chuck those little bottles in 
and clank, they've gone. I don't spend much time on that anymore. Yeah. It's, but also I've saved so much money. Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> but it's everything, you know, even that conversation about the recycling. I, I used to, I where I lived and I did all my home drinking, like the, the bin was, I had a, one of those extra large green recycling bins, right? Yes. And, and it was, would be emptied every week. Yeah. And they would pull up outside. I had an old cottage, right? And then I would hear, and I was like hiding behind my hand. Yeah, yeah. Oh it's the sound God. of it being put into the bag. To the dust uh-huh. part. And it's, yep. oh my God. I can't keep telling the dustman I've had a wild party on a Saturday night that 140 people have turned up at. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> exactly, Dave. Like, you know, no <laughs> because there. actually, oh. if we asked those men and women who collect, yeah. I bet you they'll be able to point to all of the houses yeah. where people like actually okay. there's there's some issues here we yeah. know it's, yeah. I, and that doesn't mean just i'm not suggesting that ever happens it's actually but it's information that they would know and when we begin to be conscious about like oh the amount of bottles oh the you know we already know there's a big problem there because it's we're talking about that difference between being shameful of ourselves yeah quietly shameful or ragingly hellishly shameful mm. and actually having some level of pride yeah pride in who we're choosing to be yeah you know? and it's not always about the amount either um no. you know i work with people that uh, might have a cup of glasses of wine with dinner mm-hmm. uh, and then they might have a nightcap right but that as we know is well over the yes. uh, recommended units per week but you know that's enough for them to think they've got a drink problem. They 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 won't be able to give it up. You know, typical grey area drinking. Well, just yes. not if it bothers you. Oh, I can't. I, you know, those sort of things. And once it starts to get hooked into you, then the anxiety comes. Well, that, that's the ivy, isn't it? It's already yeah. hooked. It's hooked yeah. onto the victim, and then it's you know Rolling around your throat. Yeah, and 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 the thing is, I, I'm completely with you on this because it isn't. It could be four bottles. But it's your relationship to yeah. that liquid. It's to, your relationship to it. Because that's where I'm, I'm slight, almost embarrassed to say, look, you know, I, I didn't do huge amounts of bottles every night. But pretty well every night I would have a drink, though. I mean, I, that's, that's not to say that Prosecco didn't come out. It's just that there wasn't vast quantities, you know, that people kind of go, wow, how did she stand up? No, 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 I was perfectly fine. And, oh, I can highly recommend a police issue, you know, um, what are they called? I can't even remember what they're called. <laughs> breathalyzer. <laughs> breathalyzer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I was. I, I had my breathalyzer, spent yeah. money on that. Yeah. You know, and, and well, you, you know, when you kit up to that extent. Yeah. <laughs> like I was kitted. Yeah. Now I couldn't tell you what happened to that because I actually, actually not long ago, um, very unfortunately, somebody was going up a hill and they rolled back down. She lost control. She was 97, bless her, and the driver. And she she rolled back down the hill just outside Brighton and smacked into my car. There was nothing I could do. And the very first thing that I said to the police, I called them, bless her. She was in, you know, she was upset. She was trying to get to a, an appointment. And um, and and basically I said, could you breathalyze me, please? Could you just get that out of the way? And I was so proud that I was like, I mean, I'm not saying because I think there's yeah. anything in it. I'm saying because I haven't drunk for years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not oh, going to find them. Seeing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And she did. And she was like, Z- you know, zip. I was like, yeah, I, I'm sober. So it's not going to be. Yeah. But, you know, and that kind of small thing of, wow, yeah. that surety is like. Yeah, I know. Going yeah. to the doctors and they say, how many units of alcohol do you drink? Yes. You know, yes. do you smoke? No, no, not anymore. You know, wow, you're amazing, you know? And they take your blood pressure and it's normal. Yeah. You know, my blood pressure was ter- Everything was terrible. Cholesterol, everything, you know? Mm-hmm. All through bad food choices, drinking, lazing about, you know, like everything. And it, and it's, well, the drink, the drinking leads to those bad food choices, doesn't it? The, yeah. the gorging at night and the, the, you know, the, 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 whatever you do, it's the loss of decision-making control yeah. because 
that's got hold of you. And then you do all sorts of things, whether that is having unsuitable relationships Mm. or, you know, casual things that, that you would never do if you were in your right mind. You Mm. wouldn't do it. You wouldn't even think of it being in unsafe situations. And, you know, I've walked across many, many city situations. And I mean, cities around the world, you know, buoyed up with a few, few glasses where I think, oh, I can do this, you know, through parks, through, you know, all sorts of things that quite frankly are shocking, really shocking. You know, and it's, it's the alcohol. Yeah. That has falsely protected, you know, allowed me to think I'm protected when, of course. You're yeah, not. It's a fake sense of security, isn't it? Even yeah. for me, right? I was out the other night. Now, I'm a six foot lump, right? But there were some youths out and they were absolutely sloshed, right? And they went up to this bloke, come on, mate, we're going down a boozer. And I thought, please don't start on me because I'm not in the mood for this. And it was about mm-hmm. 10 o'clock. And luckily they didn't, but it was slightly intimidating as well because there was yeah. about four of them and, you know, they were gone. Like, they, there's no room for reason with these blokes, you know what I mean? If I would have said the wrong thing or, or mm. didn't react how they wanted me to react and whatever, and then literally two minutes later, one of them pulled a big bollard out of the pavement. He mm. was, like, pulling at this bollard and he pulled it out of the pavement slab and went, Rrr! like a caveman. And it's like... God, bloody hell. Like, it, it's quite scary. You're an entrepreneur, right? And um, I hear more and more that entrepreneurs, successful business people don't drink anymore. Are you finding this in the corporate world? I think there's been a, there's been a, a kind of pandemic bringing on of what's important. I think that's, that has brought that intense review of what really matters. And some people have been yearning to be back in a world that they, you know, is the comfort of the one that they had before. And I'm aware of that. And then there are, there's a whole section of people in the corporate world, I think, that actually are beginning to question really either, either becoming sober or just moderating, which actually is partially towards it, you know, wondering, is this, is this what's, what's good for me? So, uh, yeah, I'm seeing, I mean, both from a corporate perspective, so very, you know, in massive companies, also over with entrepreneurs. So they're, diff- they're pretty different worlds. And, you know, entrepreneurs, it's a, it's a, as you know, I think it's, it's a lonely, it can be a lonely enterprise. It can also be incredibly wonderful when you find the right people. Yeah. Um, but it's finding them. And there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole question about the loneliness of the human experience, which is ultimately it is. It is, it is lonely. You know, nobody really can get in our shoes with our histories, with our, with our decisions that we've made and, and our, our feelings. And for those of us who, you know, I, I live with quite a lot of neurodiversity in my family. I'm raising neurodiverse triplets. You know, that sensitivity it, it, and of being different can be quite acute. And I think the more that we talk about that, I work with a lot of neurodiverse geniuses. That's that's what I'm I'm working with. Whether that's the CEO of a massive bank, you'll know, or whether it's you know someone entrepreneurial that you'll also know. Actually, a lot of it's neurodiversity a lot of the time is at the heart of that. And alcohol is one of the ways that we are legitimately allowed to cope with being lonely, different, mm. misunderstood. You know. Um, Loneliness is enormous, Dave. But it's, uh, yeah, I was thinking the other day about how lonely I was when I was drinking. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you have to hide for a start, don't you? Yeah, but you you go in, well, for me, I went into myself, right? Yes. And that's because I, I became a solitary drinker. But towards the end of my social drinking, I went into myself as well because I didn't fit in with the other drinkers because I was very different from them yes. because I wanted to get as drunk as I could. So I would be buying in between the rounds and whatever and start slipping away from them because I was getting more and more drunk where they were out socialising and I would look at their pint and there was like an inch down when I'd already necked mine and it was like, yeah. well, come on, hurry up. So I decided that that didn't serve me anymore. So I used to drink at home yeah. uh, all the time. But it became become more and more solitary. It, it was like a weird 
like a Pink Floyd video that no one understood, and but that was my world, and and I fitted into that world because I didn't want to be understood in a way. I didn't understand myself, so it was like that. I know that I can drink to go to that place, which isn't full of responsibility. It's I can like drift away into this fantasy world, disappearing in a in a sense, disappearing on yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know? escaping myself almost like, mm-hmm. uh, and that it kind of become this thing that I relied on in my life. It, it was part of my day, so it was like you set your day out right. I've got these busy meetings. I've got this and that, and then the last bit of the day, I'm going to escape myself and go into this odd place that I don't even want to be in, but it feels comfortable, you know. And I, I just. It wasn't worth the payoff at the end of the day. You know, it's a short, short-lived mm. like place to be in, you know. And now I'm out of it. I look back and it's like, why would I want to go back to that? And I had this conversation, Danusha, the other day about. Um, I, I I'd be interested to see your view on this. I can honestly say it, I don't think I'll ever drink again. Right? Like I will never smoke again. I knew that. I say it all the time, and I know I won't. And I mm-hmm. say that about not drinking, right? And people say, "Well, you don't know that," mm-hmm. but, but you I do. Kind of do. But you do. <laughs> but you not. really do because, yeah, yeah. I, I it's it's funny because people like to say that to me too, and it's not bloody minded as like, no, you're wrong. I, I, they can have their opinion. Anybody, you know, they're very welcome to it. But I think when we know what the damage was and and so we have to question as you just did which is what would take me to there yeah and I've I've rehearsed that like what situation what, <clears throat> what set of variables would have me go to a place that would make me or that I would feel I had to get up go to a supermarket equip myself in the in the trolley go home open it neck it and then start doing it all over again. Yeah. What would that be? And the yeah. only thing I've ever been able to come up with is the death of one of my children. Yeah. Yeah. Like the death of my child. And as awful as rehearsing that is, I have thought, well, what would I do that and it, at for? And in the last three years, I was advisor to a very well-known um, CEO of a bank, funnily enough, um, who dropped dead at 52. And I was one of the coffin bearers at his very private family. And I really know this man and his family very well. And he dropped dead about three months after, three months, four months, very soon after I made the choice not to drink. Everybody got completely sloshed, everybody. And I knew if I could stay sober at Mark's funeral, who I dearly loved as a human and a friend. And by the way, the last time I ever saw him, he said, I love you, you know which was really odd in years of working closely with this man around the strategy of the bank, et cetera. He'd never said such an unusual thing. And he just put his hand on my arm very nicely and said, I love you, you know, Denisha. Mm. And he dropped dead very quickly after that. And then my, my best friend died in his sleep a few weeks ago. And I know that it's to do with grief and I know that it's to do with loss and death. For me, the trigger would be that. Mm-hmm. And they're not my children. I've, ha- I've had a child die. So I, I actually have had to, you know, face that and, and, you know, bury a child. But, but the fact is, and I was drinking, um, no, what would that serve? What would that, what would that do? What would that do? I just think, no, Danusha. So I won't be drinking again. I really won't. I cannot foresee the moment that I would choose to do that, to, that injury to myself. Yeah. I might as well impale myself on some railing. Yeah. <laughs> Which, and I say it dramatically by choice because yeah. it would be as, as if I threw myself onto railings to just get rid of myself. I might as well do that than slow torture myself to death. I I respect myself more now. Yeah, that's it. It's about self-worth and self-love. That's real self-love. And, I, you know, it's, again, we're very similar that I have had my own issues lately and I'm still sober. It would take Mm -hmm. the death of my child, I think, would challenge me. Thank Thank you. you. Um, And I I, I had an interview with Stacey Hill who recently uh, lost her husband 
and mm. and people were bringing around uh, bottles and bottles of bottles, oh. you know, like and and as she said, um, it's like numbing out those feelings. They come back twice as hard. Do you know what I mean? Anyway. It's such a temporary solution. And I, I've gone too far down a rabbit hole now to go back to that because I, it, I'm worth more than that now. Yeah, you're, you're, you're too far into it yeah. to return. You just, there's no point of that return. Oh. And, and as you say, you're worth more than that. So it's, it, it can't happen. It can't. And for me, when I used to do the one day at a time, you know, I was rehearsing where I am now, but I couldn't keep it up. I'd, I'd make all sorts of packs with myself. Well, we'll do two days on, you know, three days off. We'll do, I, I tried every kind of strategy. Yeah. And in the end, the one that really worked for me actually with alcohol was to let myself be. And I think, and, and that meant I drank. <laughs> and I was like, there is no, if you want to drink, if you want to drink vodka, if you want to, will you drink whatever you want, my darling? This was the, the pact with myself. It's like, you do what you need to, to get to where you need, because I know you're going to come through. And so I found my natural boundary, my boundary. And I hit it and went, I think, is that, I think enough's enough now. Yeah. And that, and it was permission. I gave myself permission. And now I give myself permission to be different. I've, I've lost a close friend because of it. One of my best friends. She did not enjoy it. She does not enjoy it. So we can no longer be close in the way we were because it revolved around me being boozy mm. and she she it just doesn't work for her now and and that that's sad but I value me more than I do that relationship <laughs> you know well the the proof is in that decision isn't it it's not what you thought it was you know I've had casualties of my sobriety of people that I thought you know we were forever friends lifetime friends and it hasn't worked out that way but that doesn't change what I'm doing. It's, you know, exactly. it's my life choice. And I suppose going back to what we were saying about um, how we view it, like we will never drink again. We all have our own relationship. It's always different. It might look the same. It might be, well, I drink a bottle of wine a night. Oh, so do I. So we're the same. We're not. No, we're not. It, it's to do with our upbringing, our, how we look at life, how we feel about ourselves. There's so many different elements to the relationship that we have. And it's our choice. And, and friendships do have to go sometimes. But I will say the friendships I've made since becoming sober are real, authentic, yes. wonderful relationships, real meaningful relationships in my life. And they're present for me. They're there. And it's just a new phase in my life that feels completely natural, authentic and bloody amazing, really. Absolutely mm. amazing. And I think we kid ourselves as well when we're drinking. Like for me, I was sitting in my house, sometimes in the dark, drinking on my own. I'm like, what life is that? Nothing. It is nothing, you know. And I quite often say about ripping the blinkers off and looking up rather than down at the floor, you look up at the sky and the sun and the clouds and you look around at a view and you go, oh, what is this? This is amazing. I ain't seen this. Again, like escaping prison, the, the black hole of boozing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I, I do. And so many people are actually, so many of us, I make it much more personal, are afraid of what we might feel. You know, we, we're afraid of the intensity and the strength of our, whatever they are, disappointments, griefs, you know, failures, <laughs> that yeah. we're not who we thought we might be or that we are, you know, worse or whatever it is, whatever version we've all got of our, our inner child's demons yeah. and yeah. our fears. And, and, but actually trying to use something else to not go near that means that we never meet ourselves we never get to who we are and and actually when we do in the clarity of that without alcohol is it's brilliant it's that it's that vast expanse that you just just described which is that is us you know there is so much that we have with that clarity so much available and if we do choose to sit inside knitting or whatever it is it doesn't have to be glamorous yeah but there's a I think there is that respect and pride to it that just to be an ordinary human being, but you can be with yourself. 
Yeah, 100%. It's like yeah. a snake shedding his skin. Yeah. Or an actor, you know, I've been an actor all my life, performing this role to please other people. How can I be for this bloke in the pub? How can I be for this woman in the pub? I'm Glugsy. All right, let me get you a wine and whatever. I go home and I'm sitting there like hating myself. And it's like, remove the mask, remove the fancy dress outfit. And then you stand there naked in front of the mirror and you go, now I need to find out who I really am. And that takes courage. It, it does. And, and you know, you're reminding me of the fact that the, it's a charade in life, isn't it? It's yeah. a charade. And alcohol is a prop we use yeah. to keep up that charade of party person. I thought Prosecco was celebrating. I yeah. thought if I heard that pop, I was like, party girl, I have enough party in me. I, yeah. have, I am her. Yeah. I'm that. I don't need a bloody bottle. You know, and, and, and I also don't. I get it clouded, you know, so my intuition is is on. So we don't misread things in the way that I did. So it's that it's it's that charade that we're actually taught to put one on. Mm. We're taught to do it. That's that's the sad thing. Yeah. A lot of our system in the world teaches us to do it. And actually, that's why so many of us are, are attempting to return to ourselves, like, who am I? Who really am I? And and alcohol is just one of those structures that we have to work through if we choose to if Mm. we choose to well i think more and more people are choosing not to now uh Mm. and uh we have all these refreshing conversations Mm. and today has been one of those because it's been a real pleasure to have you on my show today and i'm so grateful you've been uh so honest about your ready journey everyone knows i hate that word journey <laughs> that's a horrible word don't say it I know. stop your, it <laughs> uh, your uh, pathway to a discovery or something i don't know I've, i need to find a new one but <laughs> yes you anyway. do <laughs> oh it's been a pleasure thanks dave I, i've loved yeah. having you on and i'm sure people can love you and i'm going to put all your details you've got a new book out oh um, yes i do yeah yeah <laughs> Well, I can talk about that in the uh, show now. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's and fine. You... I've forgotten. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Uh, it's amazing, actually. And you're wonderful. Honestly, I think you're really, really wonderful. And congratulations on your three years as well. Thank you, darling. And to you. Yeah. Thanks let's for having me. coffee soon. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Oh. Okay. It's okay. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, and I really hope you did, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts or email me on hello at schoolformothers.com. That's hello at schoolformothers.com. Well, that's all for now, listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a fantastic week and, of course, stay safe. Sending you lots of love. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 